the Metropolitan Governance Task Force of the uh, Minnesota Legislature. Uh, my name is Frank Hornstein. I'm a state representative from Minneapolis, District 61A. On Uh, explanation of what our task force is mission is and and where we're at in our, our process on this uh, issue of metropolitan council governance and then uh, most of the meeting will be dedicated to you and all of your comments and uh, we have till about eight o'clock here um, so uh, we have a good chunk of time to uh, to work with you on this issue and hear your your thoughts so uh, with that I'm going to start uh, on my left with uh, uh, Senator Eric Pratt, uh, who I, I say he's got the, uh, the, home, the home field advantage today. Uh, I want to thank Senator Pratt for um, uh, his work in really helping us uh, get, uh, get this um, uh, meeting organized. So Senator Pratt, thank you so much. And that will well, thank you. Away. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks everybody for coming out. Um, I want to welcome everybody to to Scott County on the on the task force, it's it's uh, great that we can come out to the South Metro and and uh, have a listening session out here. Um, there's a lot of uh, people in the audience um, that have a direct have had direct impact with the Metropolitan Council and and have some some clear ideas. And uh, I'm looking forward to a robust discussion. Um, and just you know, for the folks in the audience, I, I, I just want to say, Mr. Chair, thank you because we've had such great participation on the task force. We have another number of people up here, but also a number of people online. And in every one of our listening sessions, I would say that uh, most, if not all, of our members have have been engaged in these convers conversations. So it's a it's a genuine and authentic uh, desire to hear uh, your thoughts and and input as we look to reform the Metropolitan Council and make it more accountable to um, to the people it serves. So thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, so we're going to uh, go to the left here, and I also wanted to acknowledge the work that um, Senator Coleman has done uh, also uh, from the South Metro area, Southwest Metro area, and I know that you've had uh, a lot of uh, uh, interest in, in, in this particular hearing and, and uh, publicizing it and getting people. Thank you, thank you for that. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. This has, I served on a number of task forces, and this has been the one I've seen with the highest rate of public participation, and that always makes me so grateful and excited for the opportunities before us. My name is Julia Coleman. I represent Senate District 48, which includes areas Waconia and Mayor, east through Chanhassen, so I get to border uh, my great friend here, Senator Pratt, and I am seeing a lot of people speaking on behalf of that area here tonight. And I'm so grateful that you're taking the time out of your busy schedules and your evening to be here. So I look forward to hearing what you have to say and for all of the work that we have ahead of us. Let's continue going down uh, the row here. Representative Weeds. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank all of you for coming this evening. I'm Representative Mark Weeds, Washington County. Uh, uh, House District 41A, my hometown's uh, Lake Elmo. We have the cities of Afton, uh, Cottage Grove, and a number of townships. Uh, I'm impressed by the work of this task force, and I'm excited to listen and understand tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, and thank you to my colleagues, Senators Pratt and Coleman, for welcoming us to the South Metro, which used to be my stomping grounds back in the day. The South Metro kid uh, graduated from Apple Valley High School. Um, so I'm State Senator Scott Dibble. I serve in the Senate representing a, a part of the, the Senate district that Chair Hornstein um, hails from, Southwest, a little bit of downtown, a little bit of North Minneapolis. I chair the Transportation Committee. And I just want to echo um, what my colleagues have already said, which is the public interest and the public participation in this deliberation has been very, very heartwarming, gratifying, and uh, 
um, I'm, I'm really glad to see folks really focused on this very, very important regional discussion. And it really puts the lie to the claim that people don't know about the Med Council, what it does, et cetera. It's not an obscure entity. People are well aware of but what it does and its importance in public services and in our lives. So thank you. Thank you, Senator D uh, Dibble. Next, we have Mayor Hovland. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Hovland. I'm the mayor of Edina. I'm also the uh, chair of the Transportation Advisory Board of the Met Council. And I see so many familiar faces out here from years on the 169 Corridor Coalition, a 494 Corridor Commission, uh, serving on the tab with uh, Many of the folks in the audience, mayors, former mayors, I see city managers, former city managers, former TAB members. Uh, so it'll be interesting uh, this evening to hear people's perspectives on this uh, potential uh, change in the form of governance at the Met Council. Thank you. Ms. Pereira Webb. Good evening, everybody. I'm Renee Pereira Webb. I'm an employee of Metro HRA, and I was appointed by the AFL CIO to represent all of the employees of the Met Council. Thank you for being here this evening. And then we have a number of people joining us online um, from the Capitol. We have uh, Mary Paddock, and um, we also have. Uh, okay, Mary, are you able to? Uh, Yes, I'm here. Excellent. I'm here, Introducing Mr. Chair. Yourself. My name is Mary Paddock. I am the uh, public member of the of this uh, commission, this task force, and I live in Minneapolis. Great. Thank you for being at the Capitol. Um, and then joining us on Zoom, we have Representative Kosnick. Hi, good morning, everybody. Or good afternoon, from everybody. Uh, John Cosmic represents Lakeville, Credit River, Elko, Newmarket, and uh, Newmarket Townships and Eureka Township in parts of Dakota and Scott County. So, uh, welcome to Scott County if you are visiting. Uh, I appreciate uh, the input that we've had so far in the discussion in the committee and look forward to the uh, comments uh, from the public here tonight. Thank you for having us around in South Metro. Representative and Chair uh, Jenny Cleborn. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you. I, I represent Plymouth and Medicine Lake, and I'm looking forward to hearing the wonderful uh, discussion this evening and taking great notes. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Thank you, Chair Cleborn. Uh, Commissioner Green, Hennepin County. Hello, good evening, uh, everybody. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm Marion Green. I'm a Hennepin County Commissioner. I'm also chair of our regional rail authority. Um, my district includes a chunk of Minneapolis and all of the suburb of St. Louis Park. And I was selected by leadership to be on this task force because of my uh, work and interest on regional issues. I'm super excited to uh, be with all of you this evening and hear what you have to say. As others have said, it's been enormously rewarding to hear from the broader public uh, in this sphere. So I'm really looking forward to listening and taking notes as somebody else said. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Green. And we have uh, from the East Metro, a County Commissioner, Commissioner Bingham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Washington County Commissioner Carla Bingham. I was appointed uh, by the Association of Minnesota Counties uh, to represent the Metro counties. And so uh, looking forward to hearing all the discussion out there and um, appreciate the opportunity uh, for these public engagement uh, meetings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much and good to see you, uh, Commissioner Ringo. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge several other people um, uh, both uh, in uh, in the room here and um, but first wanting a, to a big thank you to our staff person from the Legislative Coordinating Commission, uh, uh, Taylor uh, Kohler, who has just done incredible work throughout our uh, task force time together uh, and particularly getting this meeting together. So as always, a big thank you. Uh, to really an amazing staff person who has uh, done extraordinary work for us. Um, now, uh, in the room, we have a, a couple of more legislative colleagues that I wanted to acknowledge. Um, is Representative Bakeberg is here, I heard. Uh, yes, Representative Bakeberg, welcome. And Representative Tabke, I saw earlier. 
Great. Thank you for being here to both of you, uh, Scott County representatives. And we also have Deb Barber, who is the Met Council uh, member from this area. Thank you so much, uh, Council member, for being here. And I know we'll you will hear from our former colleague, uh, Representative Albright, uh, as well, but um, he's still Representative Albright to me, even though he's uh, uh, what's that? Oh, Lori Halverson is here. I did not see Lori. Okay, Lori, welcome. Dakota County Commissioner Lori Halverson is here. So thank you. Did I uh, miss anyone? And good. Okay. Well, uh, before we uh, dive into the uh, public testimony, I just wanted to give um, uh, all of you just a, a bit of a background in terms of uh, this task force, what our mission is, what we've done so far, and, and where we're headed. Um, there has been uh, over the years at the state legislature a uh, number of proposals to uh, address issues related to the governance and structure of the Metropolitan Council. Uh, the Met Council was formed in 1967. It is a regional planning entity that has vast responsibilities uh, running the, the Metro Transit uh, public transportation system, uh, wastewater treatment. <laughs> Um, local uh, comprehensive plans uh, are uh, adopted by cities and approved uh, by the Metropolitan Council. Regional parks, uh, water supply uh, related issues, even uh, approving the budget of, of the airport. Um, so this is an um, agency that has a wide ranging uh, responsibilities and um, uh, its members are appointed uh, by the governor uh, and serve at the pleasure of the governor for four year terms. And so there's been a lot of talk about um, uh, the roles and responsibilities of this agency and, and efforts to perhaps uh, change the governance structure. And that's really what uh, our task force is charged with doing. What, what ideas are there for change? Is change even needed uh, is one question. And, and if so, um, you know, what, what are the ways in which uh, this agency can uh, have a different governance structure? So we have had, this is the fourth of four public meetings we've had throughout the region, uh, the East Metro, uh, in Lake Elmo, we've had uh, meetings in Minneapolis and St. Paul and now here in Shakopee. And so over the coming weeks, we're going to take that public testimony. We're going to take um, testimony uh, from different uh, uh, people who have uh, visited our task force uh, earlier this fall. Uh, we've looked at other regions, uh, how their uh, metropolitan planning uh, organizations are structured and governed. Uh, we've learned a little bit more about um, uh, the different uh, uh, departments and services that the Metropolitan Council has. Oh, and Ms. Prira and I forgot to talk about housing. Uh, and and they, there's a Metro HRA, so uh, there's a, a, a housing, a regional housing piece uh, to, to this uh, agency as well. So just, as you can see, very far ranging. Uh, a set of responsibilities, uh, transportation, uh, funneling the federal monies that we get for uh, roads, bridges, and, and transit systems uh, in, into the region, uh, prioritizing where those funds go. So um, uh, through a transportation advisory board, which is also under the auspices of the Met Council. So many, many responsibilities. Um, <clears throat> over the next several weeks, we'll be uh, having uh, different ideas and proposals uh, that we've gotten from the public and, and others who have other interested parties in the Met Council. Uh, we'll be looking at those proposals and uh, developing a set of recommendations uh, for the legislature to look at here in the upcoming legislative session, the second part of our 2023-2024 uh, biennial session, which starts February 12th. So <clears throat> look for some conversation uh, in the legislature uh, about uh, Met Council governance. And of course, this is just a part of it. Uh, ultimately, uh, we have to decide um, you know, as a legislature what to do. As I've often said through this process, uh, the Metropolitan Council was created by the legislature. And if there are any issues with the Metropolitan Council, anything that needs to be fixed or tweaked with the Metropolitan Council, it's ultimately up to the legislature to fix it. And so that's what we'll be 
doing this. This is a task force that is only advisory in nature. Uh, we'll be advising uh, the legislature on uh, different ideas uh, that we've come up with through a very, very thorough uh, process and um, uh, of, of learning and uh, eliciting public uh, advice. So with that, um, I will be uh, uh, first calling on uh, several of our uh, local uh, elected officials uh, from different uh, levels of local government that, uh, of course, all of them uh, play a key role and all of them uh, have uh, engagement with the Metropolitan Council. Um, we'll have these panelists can talk to uh, for up to five minutes, um, but in, in general, uh, we would like to have uh, the public uh, testifiers, uh, you know, keep to about three minutes um, if possible. Um, and I'm not going to be very rigid on on that. But if, if people go on a little bit longer, I'll I'll uh, give you a bit of a, a warning because uh, we want to make sure that everybody who has signed up has the opportunity to speak. So when people go on a bit longer, you're actually taking time away from others who have taken time to be here. So uh, won't be rigid, but please keep in mind uh, some uh, respectful time limits when you testify. With that, uh, first up, uh, Scott County Commissioner John Ulrich. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you on this issue. It's a, a unique opportunity at this time. And why is that? It's because there's bipartisan interest in finally changing the governance of the Met Council. I've been a county commissioner and a city council member and a member of the TAB. Uh, my experience with the Met Council is 25 years. I've been on the TAB for 22 years. I'm the longest, uh, longest serving member of the TAB. And my notes say here that we've been discussing this for years. Actually, we've been discussing this for decades, the good governance change. And the big problem is that the Met Council uh, is not uh, uh, accountable to the region. Why is that? It's because the members are appointed by the governor and they serve at the pleasure of the governor. So that makes for a weak representation of the region and also because they serve at the pleasure, they could be replaced So at any time. So that makes for a, a weak voice. Um, the reason a strong voice is needed is the Met Council is a staff dominated organization. It's always been that way, but I've been on the tab. It's, it's very staff driven. And, and our elected officials need to have a strong voice and they, they need to represent the region to counteract the, the staff dominance of the organization. You know, the organization needs um, accountability and policy and planning and spending and operations across the entire board. They, they need accountability to the region and to elected officials. In my experience, uh, the Med Council has been less than forthcoming with information, arbitrary in their decisions, slow in following through with their responsibilities, delayed in distributing funding information and dollars, and mired in conflicts of interest. And um, this is why change is desperately needed. If you ask me uh, for examples, I can give them, but in the interest of time, I'll just move on for additional points. Now, staggered terms has been mentioned over all of us years of debate. To me, that's like an inoculation to do anything meaningful. So please don't settle for staggered terms after all the testimony, all these issues. Um, it's critical that the uh, conflict of interest occurs in, in transit. The Met Council is the transit planning organization, they're in charge of operations and all the funding decisions, they have the whole ball, ball of wax. And, um, and you can tell that they're not a construction agency based on their, their your experience with the Southwest Light Rail. But just to give you an example of how this conflict of interest comes into play, uh, the Met Council sought a, a request for a proposal or solicitation for a service to Lakeville which would be leapfrogging MVTA service. They're not done, they cover the South here. So they sought uh, proposals and, and they were competing against Metro Transit. And Metro Transit's proposal wasn't even seen till after they, they saw 
the other incoming proposals before the Metro Transit's proposal was even revealed. And there was no chance that MBT was going to win the bid against, uh, you know, the Metro Transit. So that's just an example in, in bidding and how there's been conflicts of interest. Um, housing, we have concerns about housing and the, uh, the lack of vouchers for our area. And, we, and yet we fund uh, vouchers and, we, and we're not seeing the vouchers come back into our community uh, like they should. We favor Scott County, a council of governments model where there's appointed elected officials at the table and that who understand they've been working with roads and parks and land use and water and sewer for their entire career. So we favor appoint, appointing them with a local appointment process. And we, we, we feel that there should be something like 32 districts so that there can be proportional representation. You can, uh, 32 districts would make districts of about 100,000 uh, population each, which is still very large. So I know there's a proposal to go to 35 uh, districts as well. But so the local appointed um, is important. Um, and proportionality would occur as, as these districts are, they're really basically 32 is double the current 16 districts. So if you had 32, you'd just be able to shift the, the representation around so that a county like Scott County wouldn't have to share. Right now, we share um, Deb Barber with Carver and we share Wendy Wolf with Lakeville. If you had 32, you'd, you'd try and keep within the county boundary for at least one Met Council representative. Then we also favor that there would be seven county commissioners that would be, those would be appointed to the governing body. And um, counties are playing an important role right alongside cities. We, we have different roles. Cities have a very important role. That's why of those 32 appointed slots, those could be mostly city folks and the seven would be county commissioners. So there'd be an overwhelming representation for cities. So I don't think, uh, city should fear that kind of uh, representation. So again, and just a kind of closing, we've got to get accountability. We've got to have a strong voice and uh, we need locally elected appointed officials from the cities and the counties to, uh, to guide us. And uh, we'll have better coordination of transit and better coordination of regional housing. And, and I think it'll be, a great thing to, to reform the Met Council governance. This is a unique opportunity. It's never been more bipartisan. It's never been less political. It, it, you know, as long as you time this for after the governor's term is up, you know, for a new, incoming new governor, I think you should be able to make this happen. Thank you. If there any questions, that's my testimony. Thank you, Commissioner Ulrich. And thank you for all of your public service over the years. It's been wonderful to work with you. Uh, next, we have uh, Mayor Matt Lehman from the city of Shakopee. Technology, not one of my strong suits here either. <laughs> First, I'd like to thank you guys for putting this together. It's a worthy cause. I uh, wrote some notes and, uh, you know, uh, please don't take them out in a negative light because they're not meant that way. So my name is Matt Lehman. I'm the mayor of Shakopee. I've been on the Shakopee City Council since January of 2002 consecutively. So I have a unique perspective and experience gathered over the years. Our current and past city councils both support Met Council restructuring and changes. I'm a supporter of the Minnesota Land Planning Act, and I'm a supporter of the compre comprehensive planning process. As it was originally intended, the original intent was to plan for and accommodate growth, not direct it and operate it. To ensure adjoining local jurisdictions visions for growth were compatible to neighboring land uses and be properly planned for regional infrastructure capacity needs. This was the original intent. I would encourage the Metropolitan Governance Task Force to research and compare our, our MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization, so it says it's a planning organization in the name, to comparable MPOs across the country. You will find 
we have the only MPO made up of, of an unelected body with the broadest authority. The largest budget in the country, larger than 15 plus comparable MPOs combined. The only MPO in the country with taxing authority as an unelected body. And even with the largest budget, broadest authority and scope and least accountability, we like most of our comparable MPOs and performance measures. So I asked myself, why would that be? Well, the current structure has a perception of a pol political bias, and, and that's not directed at the current or any party. It's just the nature of the structure. Whatever party happens to be governor, they appoint, and the, the other 50% feels put off. So just in the basic structure that it is now, um, the, the perception of, of the po being political in nature loses 50% of credibility before they are even seated. Which is, which is not helpful because there's more than more than one party that's affected by everything the Met Council does. The focus should be on planning for and capitalizing on existing local efforts throughout the MPO's area, planning on how best to capitalize on existing and differing alternatives like bus rapid transit, high occupancy vehicle lanes, these kinds of etc. things. Likewise, with local housing initiatives, there's a lot of different things happening. Uh, a one size does not fit all. I believe the best way to capture and capitalize on these opportunities and leverage the shared desires and outcomes is to recognize cities and counties are different. One size does not fit all. And having a makeup of nonpartisan local elected officials from within the MPO serving on the Met Council brings all all that collaboration, experience, and diversity of resources into the proper planning process as it was originally intended in, in both the Minnesota Land Planning Act and the MPO. The research of other MPOs shows narrowed scope and authority combined with more accountability and collaboration netted a much greater and less expensive results. In summary, Local, local elected bodies are held responsible and expected to make local decisions by their constituents. Their visions reflect the people that they serve. Again, I want to thank you all for your time and listening to all the general public. And if I can answer any questions, you all know how to get a hold of me. I've worked with many of you in the past, so thanks for all your work, too. Thank you very much, Mayor Lehman. Next, we have uh, Mayor uh, Chris Kostick from the City of Credit River. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Metropolitan Council Task Force uh, for looking at the Metropolitan Council Task Force, uh, sorry, excuse me, Reform Task Force. I am Chris Kostick, honored to serve as the mayor of the City of Credit River, um, the second newest city in the state of Minnesota, by the way. Um, Credit River, along with the other seven cities in Scott County, Shakopee Savage, Prior Lake Jordan, Belle Plaine, New Prague, and Elko New Market are all members of the Scott County Association for Leadership and Efficiency, also known as SCALE. Along with those eight cities, SCALE membership also includes 10 townships, eight school districts, the Shakopee Manitowoc Sioux Community, Scott County itself, the Scott County CDA, the Scott County Township Association, five regional entities. I am the chair of SCALE's Legislative Committee, and it is in that capacity that I speak to you tonight. SCALE strongly supports Metropolitan Council re reform, and we are encouraged with this task force work and real opportunity for change in the Met Council this session. As this task force is aware, currently members of the Met Council are non-elected officials appointed by the governor to four-year terms that are contiguous with the governor's term. They are accountable only to the governor. This presents a real problem for entities that deal with the Met Council on a regular basis. When there is a policy fee concern, residents, businesses, and entities cannot reach out to local elected officials that represent their area to dis discuss their concerns. Scale supports a Council of Governments, Met Council governance structure, having locally elected officials, such as council members, commissioners, and town supervisors appointed to the Met Council alleviates many of these concerns. Local, local elected officials understand a wide array of the issues from transportation to wastewater to housing, parks, and planning. Knowing these issues from a local perspective allows them to have regional discussions 
and work together to understand policy impacts. They are accountable to the area residents. Additionally, scale supports staggered terms for the majority of the appointed elected officials to the Met Council. But staggered terms itself is not an acceptable solution. This provides a continuity of institutional knowledge for the Met Council as well as spans membership across governor terms. Because scale supports the council governance model, scale does not support the direct election of Met Council directors, nor do we believe that the Met Council should be allowed to create a home rule charter. We do not think this will effectively address the accountability issues. Additionally, we feel this would be confusing to voters, fall along partisan lines, and could lead to the Met Council growing larger in size and scope. Finally, Scale believes that a principle for the Met Council reform should be that the Council shall represent the entire region. Therefore, voting shall be based upon population and incorporate a system of checks and balances. To summarize, Scale supports changes to legislation which follows these principles for Met Council reform. A majority of the Metropolitan Council members shall be elected with stagger terms, metropolitan cities and counties shall appoint their own representatives. The council shall represent the entire region, therefore voting shall be based upon population and incorporate a system of checks and balances. Thank you, Mr. Chair and task force members for your time and your consideration of this important matter. We appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, next, we have a uh, former colleague and a uh, friend. Uh, to go to County Commissioner Lori Halverson. Welcome. Good evening, and thank you for that nice introduction. It's good to see familiar faces, and really want to thank all of you for um, coming to the South Metro. I'm Lori Halverson, and I'm serving as a uh, member of the Dakota County Board. Uh, my district represents uh, communities of Egan and Lilydale, Mendota, Mendota Heights, so the northern part of the district, uh, but I'm here on behalf of my board colleagues. I'm also joined by um, Commissioner uh, Bill Drosty, uh, who uh, also joined us here tonight, along with our um, great staff, um, our county administrator, Matt Smith, and um, Nathan Hansen, who provides tons of support. So um, Dakota County uh, Board of Directors uh, has joined you in uh, the, the work and the research that you're doing. Really appreciate the uh, meetings that you've had and the way that you all have been um, gathering information from around the country. I think it's been very uh, illustrative. Um, and to that end, um, there's a, a number of principles that our board wished uh, to communicate with this group. Um, first and foremost, um, we we believe in and fully support regional governance and collaboration. I think that's important to be said up front. Um, so we're all trying to get to a, a same and similar place, if you will. Um, we also believe that the current uh, structure and responsibilities of the Met Council don't always perform for every um, Met Council county, city, um, and entity, and we support reform. So we're glad that these conversations have happened. Uh, our board seeks a model of met for metropolitan governance reform that can gain um, the support of the whole seven county region. Um, and again, continuing the theme of regionality. And we support a council of governance model, which sounds like it's um, getting some traction. Um, and, and I'm happy to hear that. Um, we want to see the appointment of uh, representatives from local cities and counties um, to the Metropolitan Council. The board recognizes that Met Council governance should reflect the principles of proportional representation. Um, at the same time, we want to be sure that all um, entities feel heard. I don't think that's always the case, even, even if that's not the practice, you know, I think that there's a real goal to make sure everybody's heard. I don't think that everybody always feels heard. And I think that there are mechanisms that can um, reflect that, including um, we have discussed um, and you heard uh, my colleague um, Commissioner Albrecht talk about the way we draw the district boundaries, how many districts there are, 
um, because they have to represent so many people. And um, think an honest conversation um, and bringing our best to the table. Um, our board also believes that the council government model can be constructed in a way that achieves these goals in a collaborative approach with all stakeholders. The board does not at this time support the direct election of Metropolitan Council representatives. And we would like to see um, attempts at um, improving the performance of the public service operated by Met Council, including setting and measuring um, performance goals uh, for services such as transit and separating planning, construction, operation, and oversight of Met Transit um, and the services that are offered um, and bringing in other agencies to help manage um, uh, the uh, separations of those services. So that is a brief uh, look at, at what Dakota County is thinking and we look to engage more. So appreciate your work. Thanks so much, Commissioner Halverson. Uh, next we have um, Mayor uh, Lou Kellier from the city of Lakeville. Well, uh, good evening and thanks for allowing us the opportunity to share some concerns today, but I'm going to read you a letter that I submitted. I wasn't sure if I was able to come, so I'll just I'll read it you know, verbatim, but thank you for the opportunity to address issues related to governance and scope of the Metropolitan Council. The current governance structure has led to concerns from both parties, which is why this group of bipartisan leaders has gathered to help chart a new direction. Uh, the crux of the matter really is that all Met Council members crucial in our regional planning are appointed by and serve at the pleasure of the governor. While this system may have worked in some respects, it inadvertently led to a lack of diversity and local representation, often tied to the party's affili party affiliation of the governor. To address this, we support a shift in the selection process of the members to increase the role and representation of local units of government. The city of Lakeville has adopted a position that local governments be afforded an opportunity to provide input in the selection process of the members who represent us. Doing this would help ensure that the Metropolitan Council include the voices of our local governments, both cities and counties. Under this process, cities would have the opportunity to provide the input of locally elected officials who understand their community's unique challenges and opportunities. This approach fosters a sense of local ownership and accountability and bridging the gap between regional planning and the concerns of the residents. Changes made to the Metropolitan Council's governance model should be focused on enhancing its usefulness to local governments and serving the residents of our communities in the entire region, not simply creating another competing elected layer of government. We recognize that change can be met um, with skepticism and ensure you that this proposal is not about undermining the authority of the governor, but about enhancing the democratic processes. Let us work together to create an efficient regional planning body that reflects our community's shared rich diversity, ensuring that all residents' voices are heard and respected in shaping the future of our metropolitan area. Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Mayor. Uh, next, we have Mayor Michael Wolitz from Belle Plaine. Good evening. Um, Chair panel. Um, my name is Michael Woolitz and I um, am the mayor of Belle Plaine. I've been the mayor for just over a year now, so I'm new to this. And so I guess I can say I'm new to the Met Council. Um, I know just as much about the Met Council as I do being a mayor. So um, what, I, what I will say though, in the time that I've spent as a mayor, as an individual working with local, state, and federal representatives, um, I find that the Met Council is underrepresented by their appointed representatives. And I say that because I'll tell you this story. We sat the other day in preparation for this evening, and the conversation went to who represents Bell Plain. And the shock was city staff didn't know the current appointed representative. We've now found that individual, um, but I asked when's the last time we spoke with them? And one of our members of staff is, spoke with my council um, staff quite frequently, but not really our appointed representative who votes for our interests, an individual or 
individuals who make decisions that can affect not only our citizens, our taxpayers, our residents, and other policy binding um, actions that control our way that we govern. So I support elected officials being appointed to the Met Council, uh, as individuals previously said, in regards to regional um, affiliation, regional representation. And I won't beat that too much as I'm sure that's a growing trend amongst this panel. Um, but I just ask, you, you know, whoever it is, you know, the Met Council has to do better in accountability, regardless who's appointed, and have that individual meet and ask, because I've asked, been asked by several high federal officials, what can we do for Bell Plain? But never once from the Met Council. So I will keep it short. I will leave that with you. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity to um, present this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, next, we have Mayor Janet Williams from the city of Savage. Chair Hoystein and members of the task force, thanks for coming to Scott County and the oppor opportunity to speak tonight. I'm Janet Williams, the mayor of Savage, and I represent cities of TAB, the city uh, cities on TAB, and I'm a three-time member of the Metropolitan Council Nominating Committee, serving as the chair once. We always hear the comment that the governor appoints the Met Council. Well, what does that mean? Senator Pratt sent an email to all the mayors in Scott County <clears throat> asking about testifying at the session today, and I called him with a question. That was, I understand the task force has received background information on the Met Council and was the nominating process covered. A conversation followed, and I'm here to describe that process. I'm here to provide information for your decision, but not to recommend a decision. At the beginning of each term, a governor shall appoint nominating committee composed of seven citizens, three of whom must be local elected citizens. And all the one that, ones that I served on, more than three elected officials served. The Secretary of State office asks, receives the posts the opening and receives all the applications. Typically, we receive over 100 applications from all around the district. They're sent to the Secretary of State and forwarded to the nominating committee to review. And we meet and re read all of those applications. And we determine who to interview publicly and make selections and forward them to the governor. Applications, typically, they're on a form, they have a resume attached, and they've been, <clears throat> uh, typically, several letters are attached to each one of those also. Typically, they're from the counties, they're from the legislators, and many legislators send letters for um, several people. Um, Public interviews are held at the Met Council and around the area, with one being held in Prior Lake on my second appointment. The nominating committee is appointed by the governor. Of the three times that I've been a member, there's been mayors from at least uh, four or five of the counties, county commissioners representing um, Carver, Washington, Scott, there have been um, organizations such as the City League, the Citizens League, prominent business representatives, and various ethnic groups who have served with wide knowledge, experience, and diversity. In fact, the last committee, there was a representative from Bloomington who works in Scott County. The nominating committee must appoint members to reflect various demographic and political differences and have a knowledge about urban and affairs in the metropolitan area and the districts. 
Elected officials may apply and are required to resign from office if they're appointed. We've had several mayors who've applied and did resign and were exceptional members on the nominating committee and serving on the Met Council Board. Before appointing, the list goes to the governor. He's required, he's not required to re necessarily appoint from that list, but in the times that I've been on there, there's only been one instance where that has occurred and all it just was one person. Before appointing, the governor must consult with all members of the legislature um, and also meet with the representatives of the Senate for their advice and consent on the appointees. Over 50 years, the legislature was created by the Met Council, as Chair Hornstein said. City elected officials are typically part-time with full-time jobs and don't have a time, nor can they afford to do the job. There are 140 cities in the Metropolitan Council area, the townships and seven counties. The stipend is $20,000 for Met Council board members and they're considered contract employees. This is, there's, there's a lot of good with the Met Council. It's not all bad. It was needed then, 50 years ago, and it's needed today. It's been studied, it's been dumped on, it's been tweaked. You created it, and I appreciate that you're taking your time to take a fresh look at it. So thank you for serving on the task force, and thank you for letting me speak. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, Mayor Williams, next we have uh, Mike Wang from the Suburban Transit Association. Good evening. My name is Mike Wong, and I'm speaking as the chair of the Suburban Transit Association. We represent 12 communities and over 600,000 residents in the southwest and southwestern suburbs of the Twin Cities, and re which receive transit services from four suburban agencies, Minnesota Valley Transit Authority, Southwest Transit, Maple Grove Transit, and Plymouth Metrolink. The following position was unanimously approved by our board. Suburban Transit Association's position is that Metropolitan Council should not administer transit services while also serving as the MPO. Removing transit services from the Metropolitan Council will create a level playing field between Metro Transit and the other transit agencies. From a transit perspective, one of the structural issues that has been a perennial challenge to each of the suburban transit providers is that Metro Transit shares operational and planning authorities with the Met Council. This commingled relationship, while presenting operational efficiencies for, sub for urban areas served by Metro Transit, creates a natural structural preference between the Met Council and Metro Transit. This adversely impacts suburban providers' funding, operations, planning, and even applications for federal grants. I would like to share with you a few examples of times when the suburban providers have been placed on an unequal footing compared to Metro Transit because of the Metropolitan Council's preferential treatment of its own agency. First example, one of the suburban providers had a TSA grant prepared, but was ultimately denied because the staff at Metro at Met Council refused to pass along the application, citing that it would compete with Metro Transit's application for the same funding. Often, number two, often grants and funding whether from federal or state sources, are delayed by opaque Met, Met Council practices, arcane formulas, um, that which change at the Met Council's discretion with little, if any, notice to the suburban transit providers. Third, one of the suburban transit providers had a BRT line that they had serviced for many years that was taken over by the Met Council with limited input from the suburban transit provider and no input from communities serviced by the BRT line. Despite this uneven playing field, each of the suburban providers has continued to provide safe, reliable transit services to meet the needs of their individual communities. This has been accomplished through hard work, strong operational focus, lean budget management, and service innovation, built on the foundation of deep understanding of the needs of the communities we each serve. We believe that an Office of Transit 
or other transit oversight board that does not also serve as a transit operator would be more equitable administrator placing all would be a, a more equitable administrator placing all transit agencies on equal footing. This task force has the unique opportunity to bring forward meaningful change that all transit providers in the region will have an equal opportunity to operate successfully. Please consider separating Metro Transit and its operations from the Metropolitan Council, making its own separate agency to request funding and support through the same transparent processes as all other agencies in the metropolitan area. Thank you for your consideration of this option and this opportunity to testify today. Oops. Uh, our next testifier is Luther Winder from Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. Good evening, Luther Winder, <clears throat> CEO for Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. I'm speaking on behalf of Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. <clears throat> Following Mike, he did echo a lot of my uh, sentiments from, S, um, from the STA perspective, but I also want to just share a few other points that the intent for Minnesota Valley's intent for hopefully this creation of this panel is to create, replicate an MPO and, and a transit provider relationship that is almost, that's like all other cities and states nationwide, relationship that's collaborative, inclusive, and accountable. Because of the Met Council's conflict of interest related to their operation of transit operations, as well as overseeing spur providers, at times, as stated before, we do find ourselves at a disadvantage when it comes to funding opportunities, as well as pass-throughs for funding. Federal, federal FTA and federal guidelines call upon public transit providers and oversight agencies to engage in well-organized, inclusive transportation planning to help the region and meet current needs while preparing for future challenges. In 2020, the FTA recognized that the Metropolitan Council, through the transportation management area planning certification process, had a few deficiencies and weaknesses to outside two that are still relevant today. The first was the Met Council must improve coordination with all transit providers. The second, there was no in that, in that and that finding was the transportation improvement plan, transportation improvement program financial plan does not provide a process for determining allocation of federal funds among area transit providers. What was done in 2020 is still, effect, is still in effect today related to how we look at the allocation of the current transportation bill and the funding spoke called about especially for microtransit. Currently today, the 2024 Metropolitan Council budget, the, there's no funding, operational funding dedicated for suburban providers to provide microtransit, microtransit funding, no allocation at all. As a transit provider that has committed and wants to bring new services like microtransit to Shakopee to serve this very location and these very residents, the existing governance model provides insurmountable challenges because the council continues to focus on their priorities and not a conference or regional vision that incorporates all providers, cities, and county needs with the, as the responsibility of an MPO. I as staff am not here to provide guidance on what governance model you should foresee. But I would like to say, as I thought about it, I've been here for 20 years, well, I've been in transit for 20 years, like I'm getting old, that I've worked with multiple MPOs, and I'm hoping that whatever direction the policymakers of this committee decide, there's a more inclusive and accountable metropolitan planning organization that comes about from that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Winder. Uh, next, we have uh, Marlene uh, Renicki from uh, Cedar Lake Township. Reinecke. Good evening. My name is Marlene Reinecke, Cedar Lake Township. I will first state we have way too much government oversight at all levels. Second, I believe the Metro Council has too much authority over outlying areas beyond the city boundaries of Minneapolis and St. Paul that is no longer necessary. <laughs> This includes such areas as planning and zoning, soil and water, schools, et cetera, as we now have these types of infrastructures in place at the county and city levels. Third, if the Metro Council continues to exist, the members need to be elected by their constituents and not selected by the governor. This would help maintain political impartiality. My closing comment, we need to let the township, cities, and counties make decisions 
They can do so in a more timely manner and in the best interest of the individuals and families of their communities. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to address this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next, we have uh, Michaela Hatfield, a city councilor from the city of Chaska. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Michaela Hatfield, a uh, Chaska city council member. Today, I'm here representing the city of Chaska. Thank you for the opportunity for this public testimony on this important regional matter. Chaska recognizes the intrinsic value of a planning body like the Metropolitan Council, which coordinates regional services and addresses issues transcending city and county boundaries. The provision of regional services stands as a vital pillar supporting our metro area. However, to truly meet the diverse needs of our communities, we advocate for a change in the existing structure to enhance transparency, accountability, and responsiveness. As you consider a new governance structure, it's imperative to craft a body that not only responds, but collaborates with its affected populace. Increased transparency, accountability, and accountability should permeate every aspect of their functioning, aligning decisions more closely with the communities they serve. We recommend the separation of Metro Transit from the Metropolitan Council. Currently, the council wears both the planner and operator hats for our regional transportation and transit system, including the largest bus system in our seven county metro area, Metro Transit. We recommend disentangling the planning, engineering, design, and operational aspects of Metro Transit or aiming to establish a separate governing board for Metro Transit, akin to models adopted elsewhere in the country. Many of the suburban transit agencies have separate boards that are subject to regional planning decisions made by the Metropol Metropolitan Council, which operates a sometimes competing transit agency. Breaking the transit operating function away while retaining the council's regional planning duties could be one way around that trip tension. Creating a distinct board solely focused on trans operations and construction could significantly bolster credibility, accountability, and effectiveness. The division of responsibilities ensures that while the council retains its regional planning duties, Metro Transit operates independently under its own governance. In essence, this proposed restructuring isn't a dismissal of the council's significance, but a strategic move to refine and specialize Metro Transit's functions, ensuring a more nuanced and effective approach to regional planning and transit operations. By fostering collaboration, enhancing transparency, and delineating roles, we envision a regional body and a metro transit agency better equipped to serve the dynamic needs of our communities while fostering accountability and credibility. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor. Um, next, we have Ted Kowalski, where he's a township uh, supervisor from Spring Lake Township. Hello, Mr. Chair. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the Metropolitan Reform Task Force. My name is Ted Kowalski. I represent Spring Lake Township. Spring Lake Township is 32 square miles and we have just under 3,500 people. We're just a little bit south of Prior Lake, right next to the new city of Credit River. Um, so you know where I stand. I live in the best township, in the best county, in the best state, in the best country on the planet. And if all of us don't think that about where we live, we should make it so. Spring Lake Township encouraged by the opportunity to have our representative at the Metropolitan Council be more directly accountable to us rather than to the governor. We encourage the Met Council reform this coming session and the adoption of a council governance model with Metropolitan counties, cities, and townships appointing their elected representatives to the Met Council. We do not support the other two governance models, direct elections and home rule under consideration. I will offer why I believe the direct election is a bad idea. And I know this is kind of contrary to what everybody else has been doing. Everybody else has been talking about what they want. I'm going to tell you why I don't think we want this. And it, it's kind of counterintuitive to us as Americans because we believe in vote and we believe in democracy. So on, on first blush, you look at, hey, let's do direct elections. It works for everything else. Let's elect these people. Let's let the people vote for them. Well, let me explain why. Direct, direct elections would invite outside entities either outside the state or across the region, possibly involving themselves with large amounts of election money in the local Met Council elections in order to shape the Metropolitan Council or influence its important work. With appointed locally elected officials, that risk is mitigated. I'll give you an example. 
Under Woodrow Wilson, excuse me, Woodrow Wilson administration in 1913, the 17th Amendment up to the Constitution was ratified, establishing the direct election of United States senators in each state. Before that, senators were elected by their state legislature to then go and do the business of the state legislature at the federal government. These two guys do what the state legislator tells us. Go do this work. We changed that. The, the, that forever changed the congressional elections in our country. Obviously, I am not here to debate the merits of the 17th Amendment, but rather to illustrate the unintended consequences of that change. Since then, we have seen enormous amounts of money donated and spent on senatorial races at the federal level as entities outside our state try to influence the outcome of the Senate races and shape the makeup of the Senate. Because in its planning capacity, the council oversees local zoning, Housing plans, funds regional parks, operates regional wastewater treatment systems, is also responsible for funding, operating, construction, constructing transit systems through its transportation advisory board. It prioritizes highway, bike, and pedestrian infrastructure projects for federal funding. The council also approves the budgets for regional airports and engages in regional water planning. Outside influences would surely happen if Met Council directors were to be directed electly, directly, excuse me, elect directly elected as a standalone position. If Met Council representatives were to run and be elected in general elections, would 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 be influencers outside the local area of the Met Council representatives districts would surely involve themselves and spend significant dollars to attempt to shape the overall makeup of the Met Council. The reason this is mitigated with the metropolitan counties, cities, and townships appointing their own representatives is that the outside influencers are not going to invest large enough amounts of money on these local elections, nor would they be able to across all counties, cities, and townships. If we truly want the best governance model and accountability, the Council of Governance model is best. I would also add that the model and resulting council should represent the entire region and voting should be based on population and incorporate checks and balances so that smaller townships, like Spring Lake Township, can be heard along with the larger, larger counties and cities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the tax force. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk and for listening to me tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, next up, we have Chad Sandy, Sand Creek Township Supervisor and Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the task force. Um, just a coincidence that I'm coming right after Mr. Kowalski, um, so you're going to hear a little bit of the same, but uh, but maybe a little bit different, Ben. Uh, my name is Chad Sandy. Uh, I'm the uh, chair of the Board of Supervisors for Sand Creek Township. Sand Creek Township is one of 10 townships in Scott County, so we welcome you here tonight. Um, I'd like to underscore some of the remarks that you've heard, and uh, Sand Creek Township is definitely encourages the Met Council reform, and we want that to occur this, this coming legislative session. Um, it, it's needed, and, uh, and we also encourage the adoption of the Council of Governance model, and that allows the metropolitan cities, uh, county, the counties, cities, and the townships um, to appoint their own elected representatives to the Met Council. I do also think that it's important that the resulting council model should represent the entire metro region and the voting should be based on population with checks and balances that are incorporated into the model. My township is obviously in the metro area and we are under Met Council purview. Um, so I think it's important that townships also have a voice in the governance process. As I uh, think that you'll hear from uh, my many colleagues tonight, and as you've already heard, um, as local officials, we know our area the best, and um, we're also the uh, very well versed in the um, wide range of government affairs that are going on in our local areas. Um, all these concerns, anywhere from transportation um, to planning to parks, 
and and how they need to uh, to work together in the region. We don't support the other two governance models, that being the direct election and home rule um, that are under consideration, as Mr. Kowalski talked about. And one argument that that I've heard that has been against the Council of Governments model is that local officials may not have enough time to be involved or attend to Met Council meetings and affairs, that somehow being appointed to the Met Council would take away from their duties as uh, their local boards. Um, I actually think it's quite to the contrary. Uh, as local officials, um, kind of from a grassroots point of view, we all kind of take turns in attending to various committees, whether that be transportation, uh, watershed issues, uh, scale, planning issues, local elections, you know, what have you. So um, to us, this is all just a part of the job and, and it's to ensure that we're working on things that affect and impact our local communities. So we make the time to be available and all of us do, whether it's, uh, you know, whether we're supervisors, council members or commissioners. Um, and I'd even bet that as legislators uh, and, um, and appointees that you all do this much of the same thing. So from my perspective, being an appointed elected official to the Met Council would be a welcome body of work to my locally elected colleagues. We would be able to help our residents and surrounding communities while helping to serve the region and shape our role in it. So I wanted to thank you again um, for hearing me and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity and um, and I really appreciate your work bringing forward um, your recommendations because the reform is much needed. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Lisa Fries, another friend, transportation world for a long time. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Hornstein and members of the Metro Task Force uh, Governance Committee for Task Force. I'm Lisa Fries, and I'm the Transportation Services Director for Scott County. I have worked for Scott County since 2008, nearly 16 years. I am a community development planner by training, and one of the primary reasons I moved to the Twin Cities in 1987 to take my second planning uh, job of my career was because of the Twin Cities regional governance and planning model. My perspective is unique. I've worked for practically every level of government uh, and within um, the metro area. Based on the Thrive definition, I've worked for the urban core. I've lived in the urban core. I also work for communities that are described as suburban, suburban, emerging, and rural communities. I've served on the technical committee of the Transportation Advisory Board from 2008 to the end of 2023, serving as TAC chair from 2018 um, to 2021. I would agree that there's definitely a need for regional planning as there are just some things that cannot be solved by local government. However, I see some trends that are disturbing to me and have been asked by my county board um, to talk a little with you about why changes are needed in metro governance. I'm going to cite a few examples of shifting policies and staff bureaucracy that seems to have lost its perspective in representing the entire region. One of the major observations that I've made is an evolution in the change of how planning is done at the Metropolitan Council, particularly over the last 15 years. As the Met Council was forming and developing the, transit mo the transportation model under ICE-T, um, local government staff really drove transportation-related committee work and were part of the policy development, not just an afterthought. Now it's really driven more by council staff with limited input from local government. Processes often um, have staff recommendations that have already been discussed with the Transportation Advisory Board or the Met Council prior to being brought through uh, the technical committee. So it occurs after the fact. So it's uh, often questioned what's the value of it. 
Several Metropolitan Council staff sit as voting members of these technical committees that we serve on versus just supporting the community committee's work, which is more typical um, of how we work with our uh, elected bodies. I think a critical example of this is when the council staff brought forward funding for the arterial BRT off the top, allowing more um, funding per project for Metro Transit projects um, to jumpstart that program. And allowing them to, as an agency, pick their own priorities rather than needing to compete through the regional process. Feels like this is a complete conflict of interest. As a county that has an opt-out transit provider, it continues to be of great concern that regional planning functions and the regional planning functions for transportation and the operating agency are under one roof. There is an inherent conflict of interest, and the ABRT funding recommendation is one of several that I have, have observed over time. The unified work uh, program that the Met Council has for transportation uh, back in 2014 cost $5 million to support with staff and consulting work. By 2024, it will cost $7.3 million, and that exceeds the inflation growth uh, for that budget by nearly a million dollars, which really means that primarily um, staff have increased at the, at the council. Often I hear feedback that the process has evolved away from local, um, authentic local government engagement to checking the box and using the process as a way to prove locals have been involved. More analytics rather than a more balanced pro approach of working with project partners. The policies in Thrive are kind of another area that I focused on. They're not really clear, and they're often conflicting interpretations, even within the functional areas of the council, on how to, how to uh, work with them. There's a failure to ar articulate the value of each community type within the region that is identified in Thrive. The rural, emerging suburban, suburban, urban, urban center, they identify those types in their documents, but they don't acknowledge the value of each type of community in that document. One, uh, only I, they only identify the challenges with each of those types. They also have a, uh, uh, the council also has a, a problem with providing technical capacity to support each community type. Staff seem to be experts in the dense urban environment and have little lived experience or learned experience in caring for um, other community types, other people and places and their complex issues throughout the region. The mixed messages also come from environmental services and community development divisions, which are let's expand but keep things affordable versus what comes out of the transportation division and now uh, the water services uh, side of things. Don't expand to keep things affordable. So we as locals have to deal with those conflicting messages. One of the areas that have been great concern for Scott County in particular has been major river crossings. The region still has two arterial river crossings over the Minnesota River that are not above the 100 foot, um, 100 year flood elevation. In 2004, there was a big focus in the regional plans um, on river crossings. But by the 2050 draft that's now uh, emerging uh, for public comment, there is little mention of the need for new capacity or for resilient river crossing infrastructure. Seems rather short-sighted um, not to have this in the region. Back in 2010 and 2011, there were back-to-back -back floods putting four of Scott County's six bridges between Scott and Carver County crossing the Minnesota uh, River out of commission. It resulted sometimes in people having to drive 65 extra miles to get to where they were going. This had serious community, economic, and public safety impacts as flooding closed the bridges for up to six weeks, once, twice in one single year. The 101 bridge was selected for mud flood mitigation um, as a flood mitigation project, 
The Metro Council staff actually purported that the bridge needed to be replaced as a two lane bridge, even though the existing traffic volumes and uh, at that time were exceeding the two lane bridge capacity. It actually took intervention from our area legislators and the governor to have a common sense to allow the bridge to be constructed as a four lane project. Our staff was criticized heavily by regional staff for appealing to the governor who was at who was hearing the same complaints. Very little in the plan to it. There's very little in the plan to address this critical need. The lack of flood resistance crossings in the region. And I will quote Mendot and counties. Uh, Mendot and the counties are responsible for, for preserving the corridors, but they don't identify the Met, role of the Met Council. It should be a convener to discuss fixing this issue, and it should be utilizing the tool, tools it has in its uh, in its um, set of tools like the right of way um, acquisition loan fund to help counties and cities preserve the corridor, but it's probably already too late. Interchange request is another area that has uh, grown in process over the years. This is a new process in 2010 and was started. The time frame includes both the joint MnDOT and Met Council Committee. Most governments are directed to look towards efficiencies, streamlining processes, and eliminating staff needs to invest in programs and projects that benefit the residents. The Met Council growth in staff and control does not have that mindset. Instead, the processes from approvals to project solicitations have become more expensive and costly for local units of government. There's not an attitude of how to simplify or if approval even matters. At a regional level, Federal Highway has general guidance about regionally significance. In the early 2000s, interchanges, single interchanges were not typically considered regionally significant. Um, but as the 2040, but as of the 2040 plan, all interchanges, no matter where they are, what their purpose is, um, are considered regionally significant. We as local agencies proposing interchanges need to go um, through, prepare a memo. Um, sometimes a short memo is all that the is required for approval and it's uh, checked off in a couple of weeks. Other interchanges are more highly scrutinized particularly rural safety interchanges with extensive justification and modeling required. Uh, we had one recently that took a year and four months to get through all the Metro Council approvals and cost the county in excess of $30,000 in unnecessary traffic, uh, data collection and modeling above and beyond what is typically required. Excuse me, Ms. Frith, we have a number more testifiers and if you, if okay. you could wrap up. I'll try and wrap up here. Okay. I don't think anyone in this room would um, say that uh, an interchange is not needed to serve the Minnesota River Valley, um, orchards, candy store, and all of those things. Um, so the one last comment I would like to make is that in the regional solicitations, there's been significant changes in the application process over the last decade. It has made the forms more complicated and the process more costly. And um, that is of a great concern to us. Um, and so one parting comment I'd like to make for you in terms of uh, the plans that have been developed by the, the Met Council. Um, in particular, um, there's a statement in the plans that say, um, that on some quarters, there's a general purpose lane expansion needs due to congestion. And in addition, in many rural parts of the metro region, trucks oh, are a significant percentage of the total traffic flow carrying agricultural products and natural resources for greater Minnesota into the metropolitan area on roads where the number of automobiles do not justify um, improvements, um, MIMPAS improvements. Improvements to highways in these outer portions of the metro area would primarily benefit freight and residents of greater Minnesota and should be considered for funding from sources that would otherwise be designated for use outside the Twin Cities, such as the greater Minnesota portion of the corridor of commerce funded by the legislature in recent years. I find this really interesting that it, this is in the approved transportation policy plan. So, 
Again, no consideration of this part of the region, and it is somewhat of an afterthought. I thank you for your time this evening, and I hope you can see the need to change how our regional governance operates. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have um, William Markert, uh, member of the City Council and Planning Commission for Credit River. We've had. Good evening, Mr. Chair, task force members. My name is Bill Markert. I'm retired and I live in the city of Credit River. I'm a member of the Credit River City Council and also the current chair of the Planning Commission in our city. Uh, the comments I make this evening are my personal thoughts and not necessarily those of the city of Credit River. Uh, one of the biggest concerns I have and what I hear from other residents in my community is that the Met Council has too much power to control how a city's land is developed. We do not appreciate nor want unelected officials who do not live in our city tell us how dense our housing developments must be. Cities should be able to decide how they want to look and how many homes to develop on each acre of land. One side should not have to fit all, such as a rule where we need three units uh, per acre of land if we have a need to begin serving some of our residents with municipal sewer and water. Um, I live in a rural area today, and I and others who move to Credit River would like to keep it rural. I'm actually a proponent for having the Met Council dissolved uh, to save the taxpayer more than $1.2 billion we pay every year to an organization that employs more than 4,000 employees. Uh, the Met Council is unaccountable to voters, yet it taxes us while making decisions where we have no say. If the Met Council, and I'm a realist too, so if the Met Council uh, will not be dissolved, then I would advocate for an already elected, that is already elected city council members, town supervisors, and county commissioners to provide regional planning. Uh, this will provide better input, more accountability and transparency from those affected by Met Council decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Ted Corinder from St. Lawrence Township. Good evening. I bring you greetings from the far southwestern regions of Scott County. Hopefully some of you have been down our way. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a different twist here. Um, I serve as chairman of the Board of Supervisors for St. Lawrence Township between the cities of Jordan and Belle Plaine. I also serve as chairman of the executive board for the 10 townships in Scott County. And I'm going to give you a little perspective from the township side of this. Um, townships in the metro area uh, being governed underneath policies by the Met Council, so on and so forth. Um, we're not on the same playing field as Hennepin Ramsey County. We don't even count with Shakopee, Prior Lake, and Savage. But we actually control two thirds probably of, of Scott County under township government. Um, again, the Met Council is, it's not an elected board, it's a governor appointed or by favor. Um, you have taxing authorities, you're also a transit authority. I find it interesting that uh, you, transit authority means you work with MnDOT, which means we work with MnDOT because we have State Highway 169 through our township. And we worked on several improvement projects with MnDOT over the years. And I would like to know why we are shortchanged on our corridor with, we've got four lanes of traffic that go between Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Mankato, and then points out south to Nebraska, Kansas, and so forth. Why do we get shortchanged in the township areas for the local commerce, the local access, and so forth? We have struggled for better lane improvements and so forth. We've sat down, we were promised things, and then basically it all fell apart, and mostly probably because of funding. Um, now we, we deal with uh, J-turns and uh, um, 
uh, closed accesses and so forth. But we didn't get acceleration lanes, we didn't get the turn lanes, we don't have all of those kind of things. Very frustrating. But the biggest concern that we have right now is annexation reform. Townships need to be able to compete on a level to govern our territory with the same kind of rights that the cities have. And what happens is we look like the turkey at Thanksgiving and everybody's looking at us controlling what we can do. And we're going to get gobbled up. It's, it's going to go. Um, it doesn't make any sense. Um, your 2040 comp plan right now puts us at a very big disadvantage with the fact that um, cities have uh, their growth plan that says the 2040 comp plan, we want to go this far out, we want to take this much land. I, I own property in two townships, and the one township, the mayor of the adjoining city and another councilman serve on an annexation board with a county commissioner. It's three people I can't vote for and two township people that I can't vote, vote for, but they tell me what I can do with, with part of my land in that one township. So in the other township, we don't have an annexation agreement with that city. It's a whole different ball game. It's township law. So, um, now we're, we're dealing with uh, the city of Jordan has uh, looked at throwing a wide loop of a one mile radius around the city, up to two miles, possibly controlling everything. In other words, they would be like the planning commission board. They would technically, any permits would go to them rather than the township. And I don't believe that that's the way this should work. There has to be township government you step outside the seven county metro area, there's an awful lot of township land in the state of Minnesota. And we are an entirely different type of operating government. We, we are voted a levy to that's approved at an annual meeting. We have to stay within our budget. We're accountable for all this stuff. We can, well, we can bond, borrow, whatever in, in, a certain, in certain situations, but accountability. Um, we have to be loyal to the public and the public has every month has the right to come in and if you got a problem, they're gonna be in our face. Met Council, way too big a government. We got way too much government as far as I'm concerned. Um, the outreaching boundaries, it's like the old wagon wheel. Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, Hennepin, Ramsey County is the hub, gets all the grease, the rest of the wheel, if you're way out, like we are on the outer edge of the wheel, um, don't get much consideration. So I'm proud to be on a town board. I've served for over 30 some years. Um, somewhat well known out in the area for barking a little bit about stuff, but um, and do work with the legislators. I do understand the elected positions, um, but we got so many people that are losing the common sense value of being a representative or an elected official, or they do not have the background from a generation before. And we can't forget how we got here. We got a history so important, comments were made earlier, dating on some history facts. So anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next we have Jerry McDonald from the Chant Hassan City Council. If I may, real quickly, happened to run through um, some papers this last week, and I have a bulletin from the Met Council from 2003 that deals with the light rail is more, it's more than transit and all the promises and the ideas of the Met, or the light rail system it has about protecting the farmland and it also has to deal with the, with the uh, solid waste stuff. So in 20 years, you can send this right out again today. It'll work. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have uh, Jerry McDonald, Council Member McDonald. Thank you very much for uh, uh, placing me on the agenda. I'm not sure what went wrong. I, I did put everything in on the thing. So 
I do appreciate uh, you taking the time to hear me. I, w welcome to Scott County. I live over in Carver, and uh, I'm really glad that you all have come down to the, this part of, of the of the metro area to really kind of hear uh, the problems and everything that that we see with uh, with dealing with the Met Council. I'm uh, Jerry McDonald, and I am on the City Council of Chanhassen, but I am here as the chairman of the Southwest Transit Commission to uh, address uh, the issues uh, that we have with uh, Met Council. Uh, our CEO, uh, Eric Hansen, is also with me. He uh, decided to sit in the office, uh, in the audience, but uh, I do want to thank him for his input on what I'm going to say tonight. Uh, so I do want to thank you for, for this opportunity to speak to you tonight regarding governance of the Met Council. As you already know, uh, Southwest Transit works closely with Met Council. As a matter of fact, we really see them as a partner in providing transit uh, for the, the residents of our communities, which is uh, Chanhassen, Eden Prairie, and Chaska. Um, we are operated by a joint powers agreement between the three cities. Uh, we have run this uh, organization for over 20 years to provide uh, transit services to our communities. Uh, Southwest Transit now provides services uh, to Carver, to Victoria, Shakopee, Edina, Bloomington, the airport, and downtown Minneapolis of getting our uh, riders uh, downtown so that they, they can work. Uh, Again, as I've stated, we view our relationship with Met Council as being a partnership. Uh, we can't do our work without them doing their work. Uh, however, as uh, we are painfully aware, often the system naturally creates conflict. We're in a lot of conflict with uh, Met Council. And a, a lot of that relationship comes down to we end up competing for uh, for dollars, uh, we compete with dollars for uh, Metro Transit. Uh, we compete for dollars with uh, the other uh, suburban transit providers. Uh, that relationship has worked itself out all, over 20 years, where we, we do have sharing agreements. Um, we do want to thank the uh, legislature because on, I think, the last session, you did increase our percentage of the uh, motor vehicle sales tax, which is our primary source of uh, income. And that was a much needed uh, increase after all these years. The inherent conflict that comes about is uh, because even within the motor vehicle sales tax, about 1.1 million of that money is discretionary funding that Met Council will provide uh, to us and our, our fellow uh, opt-out or our fellow suburban uh, providers. Uh, that's known as RAMVEST. And that's a big part of our budget. And the problem is every year, we never know how much we're actually going to get. And I think as it was uh, talked about before, there used to be a formula. Uh, we never knew how the formula worked. The legislature got involved. All of a sudden, we understood how the formula worked. Next year, the formula was changed, and it was a whole new process. Again, that, that has been the main problem, is uh, we're competing for dollars that end up going to uh, uh, Metro Transit that we think some of that should come our way. And so uh, we, we're strongly in favor of uh, a diversification of um, Metro Transit from the Met Council. Uh, we, we think at that point uh, that would become more of a level playing field to where, again, the transit agencies would have to come to the table. We would all have to more or less uh, fight for the dollars that, that we feel are justified for our uh, operations. We don't have that uh, opportunity now. We're more or less, uh, we're given what the legislature has mandated uh, that, that we're allowed. And then we have to hope that uh, uh, that council has a good year or is feeling kindly toward us and decides that in their discretionary uh, oh, portion me, of our funding. If you could wrap up, uh, just where we have a number of people left, we have till eight o'clock and there might be, even be some additional testifiers. So Certainly. we're gonna really ask people to keep it within our time limits here. So I guess what, what I'm asking is, is that uh, we would like 
a level playing field. We would like to be put on, on the same plane as uh, uh, Metro Transit, and we think at that point we, we could better compete and we could better serve our constituents. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So in the interest of time management, I wanted to ask now, uh, we have several more people on the list. Is there anyone that didn't contact us ahead of time uh, that wishes to testify so I can make sure that we include you and um, then we'll regulate our time. So raise your hands if you want. Okay, we have one more person. Uh, two more. Okay, so folks, um, in order to get everybody in, we're, we're going to really have to keep it to two to three minutes. I'm going to ask everyone else. Unfortunately, we had some people that spoke a little longer. I apologize, but really now we have to keep it to two to three minutes. So um, next we have Bob Coughlin from the city of Savage. Yes, I was. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak today. Got to get off the cheaters. Hello, I'm Bob Coughlin, a Savage City Councilor, and uh, the City of Savage 2024 or 2024 legislative priorities include the following. City of Savage opposes Metropolitan Council governance reform that includes separate, separately elected officials. The City of Savage supports the appointment of Metropolitan Council members by the governor with four year staggered terms for members to stabilize ideological shifts and provide for continuity of knowledge on the council, which is appropriate for a long range planning body. The City of Savage supports a nominating committee process that maximizes participation input by local officials which the City of Savage has been part of in the past. The City of Savage supports expanding the nominating committee from seven to 13 members, with the majority of a 13 member committee being local elected officials. Of the local officials appointed to a nominating committee, two thirds should be elected city officials appointed by Metro Cities. Consideration should be given to the creation of four separate nominating committees with committees representation from each quadrant of the region. The following highlights I have been asked to present not as representation of Savage City Council, but as a concerned citizen. They didn't have a chance to see them all and vet it. Under governance, as noted before, the Met Council governing body is not just a bunch of partisan friends handpicked by the governor, but a vetted selection of nonpartisan individuals qualified in transportation, housing, parks and natural resources, human services, wastewater management and regional planning. They have been selected by a committee of elected officials and trusted community leaders that represent our communities. The idea of no representation in the selection process is false and misleading. Appointments are selected by the representatives of the people. Remember that council members are subject to Senate confirmation. The decisions and guidance of the Met Council are not just limited to a select few at the council member governing level, as said before, most of the work is done by staff and committees. I am on the Transportation Advisory Board as an alternate that vets and recommends action for approval. You have some legislative task, main task, task force main objectives to consider. If the Met Council should be a council of governments, that cities and counties will choose locally elected officials. Existing elected officials do not have the time or compensation for this extra responsibility. I already attend four city council meetings a month, along with prep time and special events. Four additional assigned organizations represented the city to include SCALE, 169 Coalition, Suburban Transit Association. I serve as an alternate on the Met Council Transportation Advisory Board. Over 20 hours a month as part-time obligation on top of my regular job. As an elected official, I already have a local responsibility that shouldn't be diluted with the Met Council giving a disservice to both institutions. I do not support a council of governments. Next one, if the Met Council of Directors should be elected as standalone position, Met Council reps would run and be elected in the general election. Electing non-qualified partisan officials will bring partisanship to the Met Council causing discord and misdirection. Elected representation representatives will think first for the communities and not for the greater regional good, pushing for projects only in their constituency and opposing needed items through NIMBY, not in my backyard. Don't let this become another partisan fighting ground for other 
like other current political processes, I do not support an elected standalone position. If the scope of the Met Council is appropriate and if the responsibilities should change. Most of the local complaints about the Met Council decision process have been because of bureaucracy, difficulty getting projects approved, failing to get a projects approved, they said no. Having rules and guidelines put upon their community like affordable housing and housing density, nobody likes being told what to do. Just ask my kids. The scope and operational efficiency are the top objectives this task force should focus on. In conclusion, nonpartisanship and cooperative collaboration overseeing larger regional needs have been the foundation of the successes of the Met Council over the years. Why are we really considering a change? Please take the time to look under the veil at the unspoken reasons. Don't let a couple high profile issues be the excuse to make changes for the minority that have had an ax to grind for years. Don't chop down the tree, properly groom it for future growth. Don't believe that new governance will change the bureaucracy and make all your dreams come true. You'll still be denied things and told what to do just with divided leadership and less functional direction. I support keeping the current system of Met Council nominations and appointments with an emphasis on reevaluating their scope, responsibilities, and operational processes. Thank you, Bob Coughlin. Thank you very much. Next, we have David Frame. Welcome. Thank you for having the meeting out here. I'm David Frame. I've been involved with local government township level before, but tonight I'm representing just me. I would like to see the Met Council go to, whether it be elected or appointed representatives, but longer terms and staggered terms. The Met Council is primarily involved in long-term infrastructure, both planning and projects. Longer terms would provide the members the opportunity to get to know the entire metro area and then plan accordingly. It would also provide continuity from uh, administration to administration. I think the terms could go all the way to eight years with policies in place to uh, replace members as they leave before their eight years are up. But I think the eight years would provide that continuity as well as a time to learn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Frank Frederick Boyles the third. <laughs> you use the whole page. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, members of the Metropolitan Council uh, Task Force. Appreciate you being out here in beautiful uh, Scott County. My name is Frank Boyles. That's the short form. Uh, I've been in local government 45 years four years Richfield, 15 years Plymouth, uh, 26 years as city manager of Prior Lake. Um, I'm still active in scale. I'm uh, a member of the watershed board, but I'm not speaking on their behalf. I'm speaking on Francis Frederick Boyles III basis. And I'm focusing only on one thing. I'm focusing on scope. In 1967, of course, we know uh, given birth to the Metropolitan Council for some very nitty gritty issues that had to be addressed, not the least of which was metropolitan area transit uh, and areas where uh, communities, uh, local governments were having some difficulty uh, resolving things. But today, my gosh, the council responsibilities have ballooned to include planning, which initially was formed for building, planning infrastructure and building it, and the operation of some awfully massive uh, pursuits, metro transit, light rail uh, transit, metro mobility, transit link, wastewater treatment services, uh, surface and groundwater regulations, regional parks, affordable housing, long-term planning, uh, restrictions and uh, requirements, and I learned tonight that you that they also approve uh, the budgets of certain 
uh, airports. That was a surprise to me. I think the, the Metropolitan Council has grown uh, ex, uh, excessively. Um, someone mentioned it before, there are 4,250 employees uh, employed by the Metropolitan Council. I don't know what the specific number would be, but it seems to me that that is a pretty significant number, especially when you look at the other uh, MPOs in other communities that are significantly fewer. Uh, there's also a 400,000, excuse me, 400 million uh, dollar budget for planning and operating. And, and uh, beyond that, there's certainly significant capital funds as well. Members of the task force, in my opinion, this never ending Metropolitan Council expansion needs to stop right now you heard a person earlier indicate there's some anxiousness can we get this done and i certainly understand that because metropolitan council is i think one of the most studied uh organizations around i'm glad you're doing the input i hope you're receiving similar input that makes it easy to pick out the things that you work on and then set aside the complex items but then to take a package to the uh, legislature and get these modifications uh, implemented. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Any questions at all? Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for <laughs> <laughs> um, Next, we have Denise Ann Peterson. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Tony Albright. Tony Albright. And I believe uh, our former colleague is um, speaking on behalf of Carver County. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and uh, to the members of the uh, task force. Uh, I do represent. Uh, Carver County in uh, my facility tonight, and I have prepared some remarks, so I'll be brief in those. The Metropolitan Council was created to provide uh, for the orderly development of the Twin Cities metropolitan area. It has the responsibility and authority to guide the region's growth and to provide important regional services. However, the Council's role in managing growth and infrastructure and directly operating regional services has changed dramatically over time. And at the same time, the role of counties has also evolved. Increasingly, counties have undertaken direct provision of regional services, including hazardous and solid waste management, transit funding and transit way development, regional parks, regional highways, water resources, planning and watershed management, greenway and bike, bikeway development, farmland and open space preservation, the regional library system, fiber communications network, and the 800 megahertz radio network, to name just a few. A regional approach is widely supported and as is the importance of regional collaboration. However, the Metropolitan Council, due to its taxing and policy authority, should be accountable to the residents and taxpayers of the Twin Cities metropolitan area that are impacted by its decisions. It should not operate as a state agency as it does now, and certainly only to the governor. The best way to ensure that the interests of all metropolitan area residents are representative is to have a preponderance of council members be locally elected officials. Such a council structure would meet federal guidelines to serve as the region's metropolitan planning organization, a move encouraged by the Federal Transit Administration and Federal Highway Administration, and make the council directly accountable to the public. With that in mind, Carver County uh, has proposed the re re uh, and uh, made the following requested positions. Reform the Metropolitan, Co Metropolitan Council by changing its composition so that a majority of its members are elected officials and by requiring staggered terms for the council's members who are not elected officials. To affect the council's transformation, the following five changes should occur. 
A majority of Metropolitan Council members shall be elected officials who are appointed from cities and counties within the, excuse me, within the region. Metropolitan cities shall directly control the appointment process for city representatives to the Metrop Metropolitan Council. Each of the seven metropolitan counties shall directly appoint their own representatives to the Metropolitan Council. The terms of office of any Metropolitan Council members appointed by the governor shall be staggered and not coterminous with the governor. The Metropolitan Council shall represent the entire region. Members, uh, those are my comments. I hope that you take them in the, in the vein that they were delivered. I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for coming to Scott County. Thank you very much, Representative Albright. Um, I believe we're, this is the end of uh, the list of names we have, but I believe there was one more hand. Please. Uh, and since we don't have your name, please state your name. So when you get up there for, for our record and, and proceed with your testimony. You want me to spell it? Sure. Okay. Uh, Julian Bergerson, J U L I N E, Bergerson, B I R G E R S S O N. And I'm from Hennepin County. I am a resident of Bloomington. So, um, in fact, for 35 years, um, and for more than 30 of those years, I've been a, um, a block captain for the Bloomington Police Department. Um, just Please, I'll just say, please keep in mind that these are my experiences and my perspectives. Um, so being a block captain, keeping our neighborhood safe has been a really high priority of mine. Um, we've thwarted crime, helped each other out, shuttled kids, made sure two elderly have received appropriate dementia and end of life care, um, assisted each other after major surgeries. Um, and I just want to remind all of you, as I have reminded my mayor and council members, there isn't enough money in this world that is able to replace those close relationships of neighbors keeping an eye on each other. So however many lofty projects and goals you have, we need to keep in mind those relationships that people have with each other and not to get in the way of those. Um, but what I see happening is government attempt attempting to take over this role um, with an ever mounting tax burden that's gonna soon misplace many families, retirees, seniors living most comfortably and cost-effectively in their own homes, City property taxes increase in Bloomington of 8% year over year, which doubles, I think, in, I think it was eight years. Our homeowner's insurance increased 47% last year, 41% this year. That's phenomenal. Um, and so now I'm gonna uh, move to light rail um, as one of, your, one of your projects and what you oversee. Um, I have a story for you. My brother is disabled. He lived in Minneapolis off of Dowling for many years. Two years ago, he moved to Florida. He comes back to visit every December. Um, this December, um, I told him specifically, you cannot be out of, you cannot be away from home after dark. You cannot ride, ride the light rail or the buses after dark. It's not safe. Um, and he also noted and expressed um, several times that the signs, and I don't know, I think Beeline is part of Metro Transit or was, they're still in place along 92nd Street between 11th and 17th Avenues, a line that's no longer in service. So that means um, being disabled, he, he has to walk much further. Um, so there are lines that have been taken out of service um, for close in, in the neighborhoods. Um, and also, I will not ride the light rail anymore. The level of crime, which I believe has gone down significantly, but if you look as a percentage, you know, if, it's, if it increased 50% and now you're down, oh, it's gone down 10%, you're still way higher than it used to be. Um, it got totally out of hand. So, you know, I really dread if I'm ever called for jury duty downtown, seriously. 
The best option would be to take the light rail, live in Bloomington, Bloomington Station, downtown. Won't do it. I really don't want to drive down there either because I don't feel safe. As an assault survivor, I will not place myself in harm's way again. And that is a very, very sad state of affairs all around, all around this, this metro. And then I'll tell you a story about how I heard about you all. Um, it was involvement with the city of Bloomington, which your website states your partners, right? I testified in front of the Minnesota Senate Tax Committee a couple years ago about, um, well, truthfully against, uh, Bloomington's asked for permission to place a local option sales tax on the ballot. Our mayor testified with their city manager by his side, and he exclaimed so proudly that the city of Bloomington had met nearly 90% of Met Council's goals for new subsidized low income and probably most often dense housing. I was like, what? And one of the members of the committee looked up and asked, what does this have to do with lost? And he couldn't answer that. A truth be told, I had not paid attention to Met Council before that time. And for me as a resident, I learned, what I learned didn't make me happy. If what my mayor was saying, that they were directed to meet those goals by Met Council, that I had no possible way of, of voting on these people that are directing. And a portion of my property tax goes towards the Met Council, which is tantamount to taxation without representation. Additionally, now we as residents are paying, well, at least a fair portion for this housing, this low income, dense housing. Um, and most likely these folks, now unfortunately, are gonna need other services, right? They're earning 30% um, of median income or less. They're living in our, res in our, in our city. Residents are gonna be providing those services. Public health, for example. So not only are you placing a housing burden cost on us, you're placing the service cost on us. So I'm just here to say that residents simply cannot afford all these pie in the sky projects. Um, so my suggestion after hearing everybody's, um, you know, should it be elected officials? Should it be government appointed? How about a hybrid? I'm a middle child. I, I mediate, right? So let's consider a hybrid. We have some elected officials so that residents like me can feel like we have a say, but we also have, um, you know, folks who aren't gonna be influenced, right? And have the expertise that's needed to run the council. And I, I don't have any input on, you know, how large it's supposed to be, but when I hear a bill, oh, I was at a billion, is your budget? That's phenomenal. I will conclude by saying, my husband and I are seriously considering a move to another state. One that we know does not require paying property taxes past the age of 65. They don't have, they don't have tax on retirement income and they don't tax social security. And we're not alone. I know of at least five other couples who are considering an out-of-state move. And it's very sad that I may not grow old in my home state. So you may or you may not miss us, but I feel really good about donating our time and our effort and some of our money to our neighborhood to make it a close-knit and safe street to live on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, members of the task force, members of the public, that concludes our public testimony for this evening. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank the task force members for listening. And I am going to give the last word to the state senator from this district and our vice chair, uh, Senator Pratt. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for everyone for coming out and taking part of a Tuesday evening to, to talk about uh, a very important topic. Uh, I want to thank uh, Senator Coleman and Representative Kosnick uh, for their partnership in helping putting this together. Uh, we have our entire county board here tonight. We've got a number of township supervisors that are here tonight. This is an important issue for this uh, uh, that, that a number of township supervisors that didn't testify. And I just wanted to say, I, I think you hear um, the level of engagement that we've had for a long time uh, on this on this issue. And I know uh, this couldn't have been easy uh, for uh, for our Met Council Rep Deb Barber to hear, but I appreciate her being here and, and uh, uh, she's always been accessible to me and others as um, as our rep. But, um, I've said on a number of meetings that this is going to be a difficult task. The comments that we heard tonight are different than the comments that we've heard in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And uh, I think we see the wide um, difference in needs and um, beliefs and cultures, even within our metropolitan counties. and. It's going to be a challenge uh, for us to um, uh, find a, a solution that 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 meets the needs of both the uh, urban uh, communities as well as the suburban and exurban communities. But Mr. Chair, I appreciate your commitment to do so, and um, look forward to continuing this process as we move along. Thank you so much for those. Uh... Good concluding words, and I'll echo my thanks again uh, again to everybody that showed up and all the elected officials and uh, you know, members of our task force from this South Metro area for their role in helping to turn you out and uh, their participation tonight. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Have we got a round of applause?